Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. My name's Thomas, and I'm your host. Thank you so much for being here. Tonight's story was beautifully written by Jessica Miller, and will be read by the always soothing Abby Offer. We'll travel back in time to England's capital of London in the winter of 1814, where we'll visit one of the city's famous frost fairs. Okay, my friends, I hope you're feeling comfortable and relaxed. If you need to shift position, take a nice stretch, or plump up your pillow, go ahead and do so. It's all part of the transition process from the busyness of the day, where we feel like we have to get things done, into the slow and gentle night, where we must allow ourselves to switch off from that more frantic pace. So as you lay in bed, I want you to just focus on what feels good in this moment. There might be something physical, like the soft weight of your duvet keeping you snug and warm. You might enjoy the darkness of the space around you, giving your eyes a chance to rest. Perhaps your mind feels pleasantly settled and at peace, and that's a good feeling. Maybe it's even the sound of my voice bringing familiarity and comfort to your nightly routine. It's easy to get caught up in focusing on what doesn't feel right, but shifting our attention onto the things that do feel good is a nice way to settle down. So continue to simply enjoy those good feelings, and as you do, Close your eyes and listen to the sound of Abby's voice as she leads you back in time to London on a cold February night many years ago. You are sitting at a mahogany writing desk in the drawing room of an elegant London townhouse. The room is quiet, nearly silent. The only sounds are the crackle of a fire hissing low in the grate, the scratch of your fountain pen on your thick white writing paper, and the occasional splash as you dip your nib into your inkwell. You are spending the night inside, catching up on your correspondence. You finish your letter and reach for your stick of sealing wax. You shave off a small quantity of wax into a silver spoon. Holding the bowl of the spoon over your candle, you wait for the wax to melt. Then, you let a pool of wax drip onto your folded letter and stamp the letter with your seal to close it. You place the letter on a tray along with the other letters you have written this evening, then reach for a fresh sheet of paper. But then you stop and let the paper fall from your fingers. You've glimpsed the winter night through the window, 
The view through the frosty glass is so enchanting, you push back your chair and lean against the windowsill. The day has been dreary, a typical February day. Cold and grey and thick with fog. But looking through the window now, you see the fog has lifted and the heavy clouds which covered the sun this afternoon have rolled away to reveal a brilliant full moon. The sky is clear and filled with stars. Snow is softly falling. The rest of your correspondence can wait until tomorrow. Tonight is the perfect night to visit the Frost Fair. You dress for the cold, selecting your heaviest jacket. It's so thick and downy, it feels like wearing a deliciously warm quilt. You button your heaviest boots and pull on your best gloves. Your head is covered with a winter hat and your neck is wrapped tight with a woolen muffler. When you open the door onto the street, the air is chilly and flecked with dancing snowflakes. But in your winter clothes, the cold air feels pleasant and refreshing. The street is quiet and empty. It feels as if you have the whole city of London to yourself. Everyone must be at the Frost Fair. You start off in the direction of the Thames, down Bishopsgate Street, pausing for a moment when you pass St. Botolph's Church. Its gothic spire is dusted with snow, and the churchyard lies still under a blanket of white. You keep walking. Here and there, the amber glow of an oil lamp shines through the window, but for the most part, the street is dark. Even the Leadenhall Market, so bustling in the daytime, is quiet and still, save for a few sleek cats that prowl between the shuttered stalls. But when you reach the corner of Gracechurch Street and King William Street, you start to hear the sounds of the frost fair. The laughter of the crowds, the excited voices of children who have stayed up long past their bedtime, the hoarse yells of the merchants and tradespeople who work at the fair. You round the corner. The narrow, cobblestone streets have, until now, blocked your view of the River Thames. But now... Crossing Monument Yard on your way down to London Bridge, you can see the frozen river and the frost fair spread before you. The full moon lights up the scene. The surface of the frozen river is thick and white and smooth like spilled cream. Right before you, London Bridge stretches across the ice. Over the course of the winter, ice flows have crashed against its pylons and piled up on top of each other, making glittering miniature ice mountains. Turning to the west, you can see St Paul's Cathedral, its famous dome dusted with white. In the other direction, the imposing stonework of the Tower of London reaches into the sky. Across the river, you see a distinctive round building, half timbered in the old Tudor style. This is the Globe Theatre, where, centuries ago, Shakespeare premiered his plays. There's no doubt that the London skyline is spectacular tonight, gilded with snow and sparkling in the moonlight. But even more spectacular is the scene unfolding across the River Thames itself. Tents have been pitched across the ice. They are all shapes and colours, small, shabby canvas tents, Bright tents, 
festooned with lanterns and strings of flags, huge silk marquees that could fit hundreds of people inside. Some patches of the ice have been roped off so guests can play nine pins or skate on the ice. Dotted here and there are bonfires. The ice is too thick for even fire to melt, and people crowd around the fires to warm their hands. Sled drivers pull revelers across the ice, weaving between the tents and nine pins and the skaters and the bonfires. You pause at the edge of the ice. Around you, people spill out of the warren of narrow streets and alleys behind London Bridge. They are all, like you, on their way to the fair. You watch them pass you by, thinking you've never seen such a lively, varied crowd in the capital before. Coming to the fair on foot, of flower sellers and cabbage sellers, done with work for the day and swinging their now empty baskets over their arms. Shop girls have stepped out from behind their counters. Housemaids and butlers on their nights off are wearing their best hats. Factory workers tramp down to the ice on hobnailed boots still grimy from the day's work. Butcher boys carry their aprons stuffed inside their coat pockets, leaving the apron strings to dangle, fluttering in the winter wind. Of course, not everyone arrives at the frost fair on foot. Now and then, the distinctive clip-clopping of horse hooves and the rattle of wheels on cobblestones sends the crowd scattering as a carriage comes through. The carriage drivers stop before the bridge. The footmen spring from the carriage footboards to open the door and lower the step, and well-heeled passengers disembark. You see gentlemen in thick overcoats and silk top hats, women in heavy wool gowns and richly decorated bonnets, and children in velvet coats. But while some come on foot and some by carriage, the distinctions blur as they make their way onto the ice. Cabbage sellers and butcher boys, rubbing shoulders with lords and ladies. While you watch the crowd, there is one figure in particular who catches your eye. A young woman wearing a sapphire blue cloak. The cloak's vivid blue stands out against the greys and blues and browns that most of the crowd wear. As she darts nimbly through the throng, her cloak slips, and you can see her hair is pale blonde ringlets. She doesn't look like she belongs to London, this city of grey fog and marble. You wonder where she comes from, And what brings her to the frost fair? But while you're wondering, she slips from view. A makeshift wooden ramp leads visitors from the riverbank down to the frost fair. You go over the ramp carefully, then step onto the ice. It's a little slippery at first, but you soon find your balance. You stroll past the little stalls at the fair's edges, where stallholders sell tins of tea or loaves of dark, sticky gingerbread wrapped in waxed paper tied with ribbon, 
or hot stewed apples. An old woman in a lace cap sells exquisite handmade dolls, and next to her, a glove maker has laid out his wares, buttery soft gloves in every colour imaginable. While you're browsing through the gloves, you catch a flash of blue at the corner of your eye. It's the woman with a sapphire cloak. You hurry after her. This time, you're determined to catch up with her. You follow her through the ice alleys that wind between the market stalls around a crackling fire where fairgoers have stopped to warm themselves, past a colourful wooden theatre where puppets sing and dance for a crowd of children. Finally, she slips into a caravan painted with bright flowers. You go in after her. Inside, The caravan is warm and cosy. A fortune teller wrapped in a bright shawl sits at a table. But the woman in the sapphire cloak is nowhere to be seen. The fortune teller gestures to you to sit down. You sink into the velvet armchair across from her. Its cushions are so deliciously soft and warm you forget to feel disappointed that the young woman in the sapphire cloak has once more vanished. The fortune teller takes your hand, studies it, then looks up at you with a smile. She tells you to prepare yourself for a magical evening. You laugh a little to yourself. You feel sure the fortune teller must say something similar to every customer who comes into her caravan. But you shake out some coins from your purse in payment and thank her before stepping out into the night again. And after all, you think, as you admire the sparkle of moonlight on the frozen Thames, there is something magical about tonight. All of London seems to have fallen under a frosty spell. You keep walking, admiring the stalls and the crowd and the various jugglers and singers and fiddle players performing on the Thames as if it were an icy theatre stage. But you don't stop until, at last, the cries and whoops of a group of people draw you to see what the spectacle is. You slip to the front of the crowd, and see they are gathered around a particularly entertaining game of nine pins. A patch of ice has been swept smooth as glass. At the far end stand nine wooden skittles. At the other end of this makeshift bowling alley stand the two competitors. One is a factory worker, wearing leather braces and well-worn hobnail boots. He plays one-handed and holds a mug of frothy spiced ale in the other hand. His rival is an elegant gentleman whose hat is pulled down low over his face. The gentleman is a very precise player. Time and again, he knocks down all nine skittles 
walls with one sure toss of his wooden ball. But the worker is even better. Without ever setting down his mug, he too knocks down all the skittles. Finally, the gentleman throws wide and misses his mark. Sensing victory, the worker hands his mug to a companion and to a chorus of cheers and whistles knocks down every single skittle. When he wins, the gentleman tells the worker that he has beat him fair and square and one-handed. He takes off his hat and doffs it to the worker. A hush falls over the rowdy crowd and you feel your own breath catch in your throat. This is no ordinary gentleman. This is the Prince of Wales. The crowd murmurs nervously. The man's pink-cheeked face suddenly turns white. Has he offended the prince? Your Highness, he stammers. If only I'd known. But the prince laughs and tosses the man a coin and tells him to put it towards his next round of ale. The crowd breaks into relieved laughter. The prince leaves with his valet. Beside you, a young girl stares at the prince's retreating back in open-mouthed wonder. Everyone in London's at the Frost Fair tonight, she says in an awed voice. The nine pins are tidied into a neat triangle, ready for the next round. But you don't plan to watch. You've been out on the ice a long time now, and you start to feel the cold pinching at your toes and your fingertips. It is time to warm yourself. In the centre of the fair is an enormous striped tent. You pull open one of its heavy canvas doors and a blast of warmth rushes at your face. In here, fires crackle in braziers and benches piled with soft cushions and warm blankets are arranged over the ice. The tent is filled with fairgoers eating spicy gingerbread and drinking warm drinks from copper mugs and regaling each other with their tales of the fair. You purchase a mug of hot apple cider. First, you hold the mug in your hands and feel its warmth through your gloves. Then you hold it up to your face and deeply sniff the fragrant steam wafting from the top of the drink. You smell apple, of course, but a hint of cinnamon too, and star anise, and maybe cloves. At last you take a sip. The cider is delicious. It sends a clear, radiant warmth all through your body, starting at your toes, working its way up your legs, radiating up your spine, and then out into your arms and fingers. 
Now you are perfectly warm. Just as you are savouring the delicious warmth, you glimpse a flash of sapphire blue from the corner of your eye. It's her again, the woman with the pale ringlets. You slowly sip at the rest of your cider and watch as she moves through the tent. In contrast to the rest of the crowd, who are all red-cheeked and red-nosed from the chill, she is perfectly pale. Against her white skin and her white hair, her eyes are a shade of piercing, icy blue. She goes from group to group, and at every new group she comes to, she beckons the fairgoers to come in close and listen to her. As she speaks, you notice how the smiles grow across the listeners' faces. They look as if they are being let in on a wonderful secret. Then she leaves, on to the next group. At last she comes to where you stand with your empty cider mug. She draws a crowd in around her, and when she sees you hovering at its edges, she crooks her finger, inviting you to draw nearer. She tells you all that at midnight tonight, a circus will perform on the ice. And this is no ordinary circus. It is a spectacle beyond belief, she says. There will be only one performance. This circus only ever performs when the moon is full. And she can't tell you what faraway land the circus will have travelled to by the time the next full moon rolls around. All of you, she tells the crowd, should come. But she looks directly at you when she speaks. And so, at midnight, you find yourself out on the ice. The stage is simple. A patch of ice is cordoned off with blue velvet rope. The full moon shining down serves as a spotlight. The woman in the ice blue cloak was telling the truth. This is like no circus you have ever seen before. There are acrobats and dancing swans. A woman who throws a handful of glitter in the air, then disappears behind its sparkly dust, only to reappear in the back row of the audience. And a magician who lifts off his midnight blue top hat to show a rose bush has sprouted inside it. But the woman in the blue cloak is nowhere to be seen. Not until the final act. Two stagehands wheel out a tall column. A length of rope is secured to the top of the column. You realize it is a trapeze. But where is the trapeze artist? The stage is empty. The crowd is hushed. Finally, she comes out. 
The woman in the blue cloak. Moonlight falls in a perfect circle onto the ice. She steps into its center, then shrugs off her cloak. She is wearing a silvery, spangled leotard. Snow falls lightly onto her curls and her bare shoulders, but she doesn't seem to feel the cold. She only smiles lightly, then turns, walks over to the tall column and climbs to its top. She catches the bar of the trapeze in her hands and launches off the column, soaring out into the night sky. She swings back and forth, turning and arcing. Then she lets go of the bar and sails out into the night, totally untethered from any rope. She hangs in the air like a snowflake. She stays where she is just long enough to make you wonder if gravity will ever have an effect on her. Then she floats back down and effortlessly catches the bar of her trapeze between her hands. From the top of her column, she signals to the crowd. She needs a volunteer. Around you, people start to wave and clamor, hoping that they'll be picked. But you remember the way she looked at you earlier and know she has already chosen you. When you step forward onto the stage, she nods, pleased. She motions for you to come closer to the column and stretch up your arm. Then she hooks her knees over the trapeze and swings down to you, gathering speed. You understand that she means to catch you by the hands, then swing you up into the air with her. You smile when she catches your hands in hers. You feel calm and sure in her grasp. With a smooth, gliding motion, she swings you up into the air. You feel weightless, as light as the night breeze that ripples against your cheek. You go higher and higher and higher still, until you can see all of the frost fair spread beneath you. The bright stalls, the glowing bonfires, the sleds crisscrossing the surface of the frozen river. You swing higher again, and now you can see the snow-covered dome of St. Paul's, the turrets of the tower, the spire of Big Ben. In fact, you fancy you can see all of London, the columns and porticos of the British Museum, Regent's Park, all dusted in white, the observatory at Greenwich. And through it all, like a frosty ribbon, 
the River Thames. It is all laid out before you, like a scene from a snow globe. Even the terraced house on the little lane, where not more than a few hours ago, you sat writing at your mahogany desk. Later, the trapeze artist will swing you back down, and your feet will touch the ground once more. You will linger while the circus packs up, waiting for another glimpse of the woman in the sapphire blue cloak. But you won't see her again, at least not this full moon. Then you'll join the last of the fairgoers as they leave the icy river and walk through the silent city streets heading for home. You'll go through the door of your townhouse, take off your heavy coat and boots, shake the snow from your clothes, and warm yourself by the fire in your drawing room. Later, you'll wash with warm, soapy water and put on fresh night clothes. Then, you'll fall back against the soft pillows of your bed and pull your cosy eider down up to your chin. Your eyes will grow heavy. Your limbs will turn loose. Your mind will slowly empty. And you'll fall into a deep sleep as Outside, the snow piles thickly against your windowsill. But for now, you are floating, almost flying over the wintry city with the pale stars above you and the frozen water below, totally weightless, totally free.